So, uh, we still have a couple more folks filing in, but so we don't get started too late along. Just wanted to uh, welcome you all here today to ACS's first event of the year. Uh, it's put on by Duke Law's chapter of the American Constitution Society, a progressive legal organization founded on the principle that law should be a force for improving the lives of all people. Uh, the event was also co-sponsored by the Asian Pacific American Law Student Association and the Muslim Law Students Association. And we would also like to uh, thank the firm of Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld for generously lending us Mr. Shaw for the day. <laughs> um, we have three fabulous speakers today. We have, uh, first and foremost, Dean Kerry Abrams uh, here at the law school, um, who is a nationally renowned expert on immigration law. We have Professor Eric Muller, who's the Dan K. Moore Distinguished Professor of Law and Jurisprudence and Ethics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Among his other specializations, he is one of the nation's leading experts on the Japanese American internment and detention during World War II, as well as subsequent efforts to sort of address those wrongs. And then finally, we have uh, Pratik Shah, uh, who is a partner and head of Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld's Supreme Court appellate practice. Uh, he's argued 14 cases before the Supreme Court and filed merit Merit, merit briefs or cert stage briefs on uh, over 150 more. Among those, he was um, the lead counsel and lead writer of a brief filed on behalf of the Fred Korematsu Center in the travel ban litigation, and that's um, what he'll be speaking to today. And then finally, uh, we have a fabulous moderator, uh, Professor Matthew Adler, uh, who's the Richard A. Horvitz Professor of Law and, uh, on, on Economics, Philosophy, and Public Policy here at Duke. And he teaches constitutional law and administrative law, and these days focuses his research on prioritarianism or the notion that policy should be crafted to give extra priority to those who are worse off. So without further ado, let's dive into things. Sure. Thank you so much for coming. Sure. Sure. Thank you for coming. Thank you to our three uh, uh, speakers here, and thank you, Isaac and ACS, for organizing this. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'll start with Professor Muller. I mean, again, the, the idea here is just to, to uh, have us uh, uh, talk and, and, and get a handle not just on Trump against Hawaii, the travel ban case, but also how it uh, relates to uh, Korematsu uh, and the other uh, exclusion cases from uh, the 1940s, Hirabayashi, uh, Ex Partiendo, uh, Justice Sotomayor, right, and her dissent in Trump against Hawaii, uh, making this quick, explicit linkage uh, to Korematsu uh, and the majority uh, denies that the uh, travel ban is anything like the uh, exclusion order uh, in Korematsu, and indeed the majority uh, 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 says that Korematsu is overruled. So we want to get a handle on that as well as understanding uh, uh, Trump against Hawaii uh, itself. Um, so perhaps, Professor Muller, you could just fill us in, uh, 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 re-familiarize us with uh, the exclusion uh, cases, um, you know, uh, as you see relevant to uh, Trump against Hawaii. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I wanted to also thank ACS and the others for sponsoring an event uh, like this one uh, on some such important and timely topics. Um, so um, I'll try to tailor the, a couple of minutes worth of uh, comments about Korematsu and the other cases specifically to the issues that I think are relevant under Trump versus Hawaii. Um, many of you may know that there were, at the time of Pearl Harbor, two generations of um, people of Japanese ancestry in the United States, 93% of them along the West Coast. Uh, the immigrant generation were called the Issei. They were aliens. They were not citizens. They were not allowed to become citizens because American naturalization law at that time did not allow Asians to naturalize. Um, they had all been in the country since uh, 1924 at the latest, because that's when uh, American law also shut down further immigration of people from Japan. They had children here in the United States. Their children were born in the United States. They were the second generation, or so-called Nisei generation. They were American citizens because the 14th Amendment says so. They were born in the United States, and therefore, for that reason, were American citizens. So you had an alien generation, a non-citizen generation, and a citizen generation. Um, in 1941, when Pearl Harbor attacked, um, a decision was uh, made over a period of several months to uh, uproot the entire population from their homes along the coast, Issei and Nisei alike, without regard to citizenship. That's an important point, or a potentially important point. Uh, all people of Japanese ancestry were uprooted from their homes in a strip along the West Coast, 
and were initially taken for the summer of 1942 to euphemistically termed assembly centers, uh, in, uh, which were basically concentration camps in uh, urban centers along the West Coast. And then in the fall of 1942, they were rolled out from those camps to permanent camps uh, in um, mostly in the Mountain West, uh, although they went as far east as Arkansas, too. There were two camps in Arkansas. Um, the removal was the second major order that was imposed on people of Japanese ancestry. Before the removal orders, there was a prior order of curfew. Um, so the first thing that the commanding general out in the Presidio in San Francisco did was to impose a dusk to dawn curfew on people of Japanese ancestry. Uh, and um, there was a young man named Gordon Hirabayashi uh, uh, who um, challenged that. I can spare you the story of how it happened, but he challenged that in court, the curfew. Uh, this was a racially specific curfew because it did not apply to German Americans, that is to say American citizens of German ancestry, or to American citizens of Italian ancestry, even though we were equally at war with both Germany and Italy. Um, at roughly the same time, or a few weeks later, a guy named Fred Korematsu, uh, living in San Leandro, California, decided uh, in the face of an order to uh, uh, report for removal from his home uh, to one of these uh, assembly centers, one of these concentration camps, he decided that he did not want to comply. He wanted to just uh, keep living with his girlfriend uh, and not show up. And he was ultimately arrested and charged, both of them, Hirabayashi and Korematsu, were both charged with a crime in the civilian courts for violating a federal statute that made it illegal for a person to willfully violate an order of the commanding general of the Western Defense Command. So they were both prosecuted in civilian court, in federal courts, for violating both the curfew in Hirabayashi's case and um, uh, removal in the case of, uh, of Fred Korematsu. Uh, that litigation lasted over a couple of years. In 1943, the Supreme Court unanimously addressed Gordon Hirabayashi's challenge to the curfew and upheld it unanimously. Um, there were some worried justices, uh, but they ultimately were persuaded to go along, so that was a unanimous nine to nothing. A year later, in December of 1944, the Supreme Court addressed the Korematsu case. People often think that Korematsu was a validation of the so-called internment of people, that is to say their detention, it wasn't. The detention issue was not before the court in Korematsu. The issue before the court in Korematsu was removal, the constitutionality of the mass removal of American citizens from the West Coast. The, this litigation did not touch the rights of non-citizens. Uh, their rights were undoubtedly violated, but these were cases questioning the rights of citizens. Um, I'll just mention that the, and I'll stop in a second, um, I, I, that the, the government actually did have a way of lawfully proceeding against non-citizens from Japan because under the Alien Enemies Act of 1798, um, the government has the power to do most anything um, to uh, so-called enemy, enemy aliens, aliens in the United States of countries with whom the United States is in a declared war. The government did, in fact, intern a couple of thousand Japanese aliens under that statute, along with several thousand German aliens and several, uh, well, actually just a couple of hundred Italian aliens. What happened to most people of Japanese ancestry, most of these Japanese aliens along the coast, was not that. They were not uh, removed or detained pursuant to that law. They were instead removed and detained pursuant to this executive order uh, that authorized the military to pick them up and remove them, in a sense, outside of law, you might say. Um, so the Supreme Court in uh, 44 upholds Fred Korematsu's conviction for violating the removal order. Uh, the court fractures, so Hirabayashi had been nine to nothing. Uh, Korematsu is six to three. A majority of six justices conclude uh, that while um, racial classifications, racial line drawing triggers the strictest of judicial scrutiny, uh, a principle that remains valid um, uh, to this day, 
um, the court concluded applying something that looked very, very little like strict scrutiny that the governments, the militaries, uh, the military had a reasonable uh, basis for concluding that this group um, was of su su sufficient suspicion to warrant their mass removal. Um, I think maybe others can explain a little bit more about that litigation. Turns out the government was playing a little bit fast and loose in the Supreme Court litigation in both Hirabayashi and Korematsu, concealing certain facts and suppressing others. Um, but anyway, the court concludes six to three. On that same day, the Supreme Court decides another case that no one's ever heard of called Ex Parte Endo. This was a third Japanese American litigant who filed a habeas corpus petition uh, claiming that she had been as effectively validated by the government's loyalty scrutiny process and that it was unlawful to continue to detain her. The Supreme Court unanimously up, um, agreed with her so on the same day that the Supreme Court, by six to three, validated mass removal under constitutional law in Korematsu, it struck down continued detention as a matter of, you might say, administrative law, not constitutional law, in the Endo case. Um, I guess I'll stop there, um, and uh, maybe we can pick back up on that a little bit later. Thank you so much, Professor Muller. That was uh, fantastic. Um, Councilor Shaw, you and your firm were intimately involved um, with the uh, travel ban uh, litigation. Uh, so maybe you could just be, uh, briefly describe that involvement and, and, and uh, the various stages of that litigation leading up to the Supreme Court decision. Uh, sure. So uh, it's been my privilege to represent uh, Karen Korematsu, Jay Hirabayashi, and Holly Yasui. These are the children of, uh, of two of the three folks that, that were mentioned, uh, Fred Korematsu's daughter, Karen Korematsu, uh, Jay Hirabashi is Gordon Hirabashi's son, and uh, Hali Yasui is uh, the daughter of the third Japanese American who challenged. He's actually the first one uh, to be arrested and tried, um, and his case has never got the same merits uh, disposition uh, as 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 uh, Fred Korematsu and Gordon Hirabayashi. But all three of them came together um, in this litigation in conjunction with the Korematsu Center and a host of civil rights groups across the spectrum. Uh, to, to really um, give, lend their voice um, to the problematic um, parallels raised between the Trump travel ban and uh, what happened to their fathers um, uh, during the World War II Japanese inc incarceration that Professor Muller um, just discussed. And, and so, you know, when we're talking about amicus briefs in the Supreme Court and lower courts, um, you know, obviously these days there are lots of amicus briefs being filed by lots of people in just about every case. And particularly when you have a high profile case like this, we are talking about dozens and dozens, close to an upward of 100 amicus briefs um, in, in the highest profile cases now in the Supreme Court. So when we look at amicus briefs, um, we try really hard uh, to kind of limit our involvement in amicus briefs uh, unless they really meet two major uh, criterion. Um, one is, do you have a compelling message? And two is, do you have a compelling messenger? Um, and here we thought we had both um, in spades. A compelling message that we thought there was no more compelling historical parallel than the Japanese Am American incarceration cases, uh, and in particular, Korematsu. Um, uh, if you're talking about like a Supreme Court hall of shame, you know, you probably put Plessy, Dred Scott, and Korematsu in that hall of shame. It's, it's not any case that any Supreme Court justice wants to be associated with, uh, and yet the Supreme Court had not formally overruled uh, that decision, a decision. So we thought we had a pretty compelling message uh, uh, that we could uh, send and some pretty striking parallels that we could draw, which I'm sure we'll talk about um, um, as this panel goes on. And then the second criterion, messenger. Um, we thought we had no better voice to make that point rather than a group of academics or a group of civil rights groups standing on their own, uh, but to have those folks come together with Karen Korematsu, Jay Hirabayashi, and Hali Yasui to really, uh, they've spent their lives um, really um, 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 educating folks about their, parent, uh, about their parents' legacies, um, and, and this was really, uh, I think, a moment that they could come together and lend their voice to the court. So 
the litigation, of course, we've had a lot of eye-opening things uh, come out of the White House, but so it's hard to lose track. It's easy to lose track of time. But th this actually started less than two years ago, January 2017, soon after President Trump uh, comes into power, you know, fulfilling one of his campaign promises. He immediately suspends uh, the entry of all citizens from six Muslim-majority nations. That, of course, led to all the news reports that you saw, the chaos at the airports, uh, lawyers coming to the airports to try to lend a hand, uh, a flurry of subsequent legal activity, lawsuits filed, lower court injunctions, virtually every lower court that was brought the suit entered some form of injunction against that original uh, travel ban. Uh, uh, but before that could uh, work its way up to the Supreme Court, um, the administration wisely uh, replaced that travel ban with what most folks call travel ban 2.0, trying to address kind of the most glaring legal flaws in that first travel ban, for example, which had no exception for lawful permanent residents, uh, green card holders, uh, which uh, you know had an exemption that favored Christian minorities in those countries. So kind of cleaned that stuff up you get travel ban 2.0, immediately lawsuits are refiled against travel ban 2.0, which in large part is, is, is the same. Um, more lower court injunctions, again, virtually every lower court to hear it enjoins it in some form or another, um, including the Fourth and Ninth Circuits. Um, and then at that point, the SG petitions for cert and, and uh, seeks a stay. Pending certiorari in the Supreme Court, and this is sort of right before they're leaving uh, for the summer, um, or right actually after they had left for the summer uh, in terms of what this timing of the stay, issues essentially a partial stay of the injunctions. That means a travel ban can essentially go into effect for all but those who have a bona fide relationship to the United States, whatever that means. That's teed up for oral argument then. They grant cert, issue that stay. That's teed up for oral argument in what would have been a year ago in October, the very beginning of last year's term. Uh, but um, quite strategically, I think uh, the Solicitor General um, litigated uh, this case in, in a, a pretty strategic fashion, and, and, uh, and it paid off for them, is they were able to get that travel ban case mooted out before the oral argument, and that's because there had been a clock on travel ban 2.0, and they were able to drag it out to the point where that travel ban had mooted out, um, and so that was followed by what everyone calls travel ban 3.0. Uh, that's the case that was actually litigated uh, in the Supreme Court this past term in which we got a decision. Now, Travel Ban 3.0, again, is largely similar to the first two iterations, uh, but it has three main differences. Um, one is it is based, and this is probably the most important difference, it's based on the so-called intergovernmental global review and report. This is an interagency report spearheaded by the Secretary of DHS, which purports to examine the, the review, visa review procedures of, of all the countries um, and then tries to identify countries um, that don't live up to the standards uh, that they think are requisite for national security. So it's uh, based, um, supposedly based on this intergovernmental review report which had been completed in the prior 90 days. So that's one big difference. Two uh, is that they added a couple non-Muslim countries to the list, so Venezuela and North Korea. Um, Guessing North Korea was not a hotbed of immigration uh, to the United States, so you can query what uh, what that was actually, what work that was actually doing. But that was a second feature uh, that was different from the prior travel bans. And then the third is it added different categories. Uh, it wasn't a categorical ban, so for some of the countries it was a categorical ban, for, but for others they would allow certain non-immigrant classes of visas, uh, and they would have a waiver, a case-by-case -case waiver program. Um, um, that was in the face of the program. So those were the, the basic differences. Again, obviously lawyers influencing how they were tailoring the travel ban in each iteration, trying to make it more and more defensible, and the Solicitor General successfully keeping it out of the Supreme Court, really, uh, at least a merits decision until they had this uh, new and improved travel ban 3.0 um, um, in terms of at least being more defensible. That is followed by more lower court injunctions. Again, uh, lower courts by and large enjoying this, notwithstanding these differences. And, uh, but the Supreme Court enters um, a, a, essentially a full stay of those injunctions. So travel ban 3.0 goes into full effect pending the Supreme Court's decision. It's finally argued. 
Um, and oh, for those following um, um, who don't follow Supreme Court litigation as closely, it's a really bad sign for you when the Supreme Court enters a stay pending its decision, because as you know, the criteria, one of the criterion for a stay is typically likelihood of success on the merits. And so when you're reading into this thing, you know, those of us watching the case, you know, that, that was a pretty bad sign when the Supreme Court entered the stay pending, um, pending disposition on search. Anyways, it's teed up for argument in April. Um, and uh, it's argued in April, and, and we got the decision. I don't want to steal the dean's thunder, so uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll have a segue there. Thank you so much. Um, let me say we're, we're going to we'll take some questions at the at the, at the end. Uh, that was that was uh, terrific. Um, uh, so for Dean Abrams, yeah, I mean, so broadly speaking, the decision uh, there there are two challenges: there's a statutory challenge uh, uh, and then an establishment clause challenge, both of which are rejected uh, by uh, the majority. Uh, and then we have two dissents, uh, uh, a dissent authored by Breyer uh, that Kagan joins, and a separate dissent authored by uh, 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 Justice Sotomayor that Ginsburg joins. As I read them, both of them focus simply on the um, constitutional issue, not the statutory issue. Uh, and um, yeah, but if you could just you know, uh, say a little more about that uh, as, as you see relevance. Yeah, so I guess the first thing I'd say is that I don't think the outcome of the case was particularly surprising to most of us involved in the litigation. And I say that as someone who also filed an amicus brief uh, that was asking for a different outcome um, and filed several amicus briefs uh, in earlier stages of the litigation. Uh, my briefs were focused on family reunification claims. Um, but there is such a broad uh, power uh, granted to both Congress and the President in regulating immigration law, that it would have been unusual for the court to have deviated from uh, offering uh, a lot of deference to either Congress or the executive in these cases. And the main reason why this case was worth fighting uh, was the history uh, that we just heard about of the of evolution of these travel bans and the campaign comments and then even some comments um, um, after the inauguration about Muslims. So really the crux of the case was, is it okay for the president to do this for, if we believe that his purpose in doing this is prejudice against Muslims or the attempt to establish uh, religion? Um, and the, the executive order on its face said nothing about religion and nothing about Muslims, nothing about Islam. And so um, this was gonna be a, a difficult uphill battle, I think, from the beginning. Uh, let me say a little bit about the scope of the immigration power uh, to help those of you who aren't as steeped in immigration law as some of us <laughs> understand uh, why this context is so different. And I think that'll help tee up the conversation about Korematsu as well. Um, so ironically enough, there's actually no constitutional textual provision that grants uh, either the president or Congress control over immigration. Uh, if you go searching through Article I for congressional power, you'll find uh, the power to create a uniform rule of naturalization. That's about who gets to become a citizen. Uh, you'll find a migration clause that says something about not restricting uh, migration before 1808, which uh, people pretty much universally believe was a re reference to the slave trade. Um, you'll find a war power, uh, which in some circumstances might lead you to restrict immigration, but there's nothing actually about immigration. And so it, the reason I say it's a little bit ironic is that immigration is actually one of the uh, most expansive powers that the Supreme Court has held uh, belongs to the political branches, even though there's no textual support for it. Um, and really the theory behind this is uh, that a sovereign nation needs to be able to control its borders. So the Supreme Court has used the phrase, power inherent in sovereignty. There are certain powers you just have to have or you're not a nation. Um, one of them is power over national security, one of them is power over foreign affairs, and one of them is power over immigration. And then in the US context, uh, also power uh, uh, to negotiate with uh, Native American tribes. Um, so uh, ever since the 1870s and 1880s, uh, this doctrine, which is referred to as the plenary power doctrine, has been the doctrine that has governed 
in Supreme Court cases about immigration. And I think it's important to understand that the early cases were actually about race and national origin. So it's not as if this power developed in a race neutral context and then now is getting applied in a situation um, where arguably the, the group that's being targeted is a racial or ethnic or, or certainly religious group. Um, the cases in which it was first articulated were cases about exclusion of Chinese immigrants. Um, and so immigration law has always been the one area in, that is largely exempt from the kind of equal protection analysis that you would see in other sorts of cases. Um, now that's, an, that's a, an issue that many people were hoping to challenge and these cases seem to be one of the best uh, opportunities to do that because it's unusual to have the kind of record of statements by a president or by a presidential candidate um, telling what their true purposes were, right? Normally, we don't see these kinds of statements or I don't think we've had a president who's tweeted before, um, <laughs> at least not to this extent. Um, and so there was this rich record of comments that were um, external to the actual executive order. Um, in addition, there was this evolution of the order over time, which made it appear that the order was being cleaned up or sanitized enough um, so that it might pass muster, right? So that was really the, the reason um, that, that these cases were, were so uh, ripe for, for litigation. Um, now, the specific issue in the case uh, was whether the president actually had authority to do this. And uh, what was not litigated was whether the president had in independent constitutional authority. Instead, it was a delegation argument. It was Congress has authority over immigration, and Congress, through the Immigration and Nationality Act, has delegated to the president uh, the ability to exclude some people in certain circumstances. And so I just want to read to you the, the piece of the statute that was at issue. And um, if you can try to put the, the comments about Muslims out of your mind for a moment and put this particular president out of your mind and just listen to the words. <laughs> Imagine what this might mean um, in lots of other kinds of situations. I think it will help. Here's the provision. Whenever the president finds that the entry of any aliens or of any class of aliens into the United States would be detrimental to the interests of the United States, he may, by proclamation, and for such period as he shall deem necessary, suspend the entry of all aliens or any class of aliens as immigrants or non-immigrants, or impose on the entry of aliens any restrictions he may deem appropriate. So that's pretty breathtakingly broad language, um, giving the president authority to just decide that it's not in the best interest of the United States to have an individual person or a whole class of persons. So the question is, can the president do that if his purpose is some other form of unconstitutional animus, right? Can the president exercise this really broad power? And there was a statutory argument made that, that another piece of the statute nullified this power. Uh, there's another piece of the statute that says, no person shall receive any preference or priority or be discriminated against in the issuance of an immigrant visa because of the person's race, sex, nationality, place of birth, or place of residence. So on its face, that looked like a possible uh, rebuttal to this broad power. Um, the problem with that particular statutory provision is it refers to just immigrant visas, and immigrant visas refer to permanent residency visas not non-immigrant non visas. So in our everyday parlance, we speak of immigrants as being non-citizens, but in the, in the actual statute, anyone who's here on a student visa, a temporary work visa, a tourist visa, an exchange visa, those are all non-immigrant visas. Those aren't covered. So by the text of the statute, you could discriminate in those cases. And as was mentioned, uh, as the executive orders got more and more tailored and enforced differently, but that was the group of people who was largely being targeted. Um, the other problem with it is that piece of the statute read in context is in a part of the statute that's really about um, the national uh, origins caps. So there used to be, uh, prior to uh, the 1965 um, Immigration Act, 
uh, caps on some countries. So uh, 100 person uh, cap per year uh, for many countries. And, and um, some, some uh, nations were excluded altogether. And so when that got changed, um, th this non-discrimination provision got put in. But it's really for it deciding who's going to be admitted for these for purposes of the number of people in different categories that can come each year. This isn't a part of the statute that's about what the president might do as, as a temporary or emergency or even permanent um, order. So the statutory argument didn't really work and, uh, and was rejected by the court. The more interesting argument that had more promise, I think, is the constitutional one. And that's where we run into this problem of what happens when this, the, the order on its face has no animus in it, and yet we know that there's animus out there. Um, and uh, Chief Justice Roberts ultimately uh, decided for the majority that we couldn't consider, that they couldn't consider those, those other statements made by the president, that they weren't relative, relevant to the determination. And I think that, I don't think most people would disagree that if those statements hadn't been made, um, that there would be a case here at all, right? So it really hinged on whether this animus had so infected the third version of the executive order uh, that it that it was unconstitutional. Um, but but that was the, the the basic constitutional background for the for the case and the statutory issues that it involved. Thank you so much, Craig. So in the interest of time, I'm going to ask you first uh, just to go down. I'll ask, I'll ask all of you to comment briefly on uh, the constitutional issue, and then. I'll ask about the analogy to Korematsu. Um, but constitutionally, right, so, so, so uh, uh, both majority and dissent really focus on the establishment clause, right? Um, uh, and the question constitutionally is to what extent uh, is all of this, you know, apparent evidence of purpose, right, uh, of President Trump's statements during this campaign and so forth, uh, relevant as an establishment clause matter? So Sotomayor leans on standard establishment clause jurisprudence. Uh, which says when government acts with the ostensible predominant purpose of disfavoring religion, it violates the establishment clause, right? And there are lots of cases where, uh, uh, involving states principally, where the courts apply that and, and it's looked to actual purpose. And so all of the evidence of purpose that she points to comes in under this establishment clause purpose test, which specifically looks to the reactions of the reasonable observer. The majority does this sort of weird doctrinal uh, move where it, it, you know, it, it pursues establishment clause analysis but it uses the animus doctrine that the court uh, 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 had put in place under the Equal Protection Clause, right? In cases like uh, Moreno, City of Claiborne, and Romer, it ignores the most recent such case, which is Windsor. Uh, um, now, one of the things about animus, if you look at cases like, like Moreno and Claiborne, is that the court actually seems to look at actual evidence of animus, right? It doesn't simply say, is the, is, is the statute rationalizable in terms of rational basis, but we're going to look to sort of actual evidence of animus. The court here, uses this equal protection uh, uh, doctrine uh, uh, in thinking about the establishment clause challenge, but doesn't look to actual purpose. So I guess the question is, you know, who's right? I mean, understanding that we're focused here on the president, right, uh, um, uh, and the president acting with this broad statutory delegation from Congress, right, is the majority right that the relevant test of the establishment clause should not allow us to look to purpose, or is the dissent right that we should simply import the standard established was a uh, test that we use in other contexts, which does allow us to look at a uh, 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 subjective purpose. I'm, I'm happy to start. I mean, to me, it was an odd doctrinal move to start invoking sort of the levels of scrutiny and rational basis, because usually we use, at least I thought of, always thought of the, the levels of scrutiny that we use are there to ferret out evidence of animus, right? The reason we have these different levels of scrutiny, strict scrutiny with respect to race, intermediate scrutiny with respect to gender, rational basis for everything else, is because we, we're using these tools with varying level degrees of scrutiny to ferret out, is there, in fact, uh, animus there? And not in, for cases in which you actually have direct evidence of animus. To me, then, the rational basis uh, the, the, the levels of scrutiny sort of are beside the point, because here you actually have direct evidence of animus. So the question should be, okay, well, let's look at that direct evidence of animus, and does the purported national security justification for this travel ban, does it outweigh that? Is, was the real driver ultimately the national security uh, uh, justification? Or even if that wasn't the real driver, is that a real plausible 
justification for the, for this thing. And to me, that's where the court sort of went wrong and sort of importing this, this rational basis scrutiny, which normally works, right? Normally works when you have racial, religious sort of um, 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 uh, classifications. You want to try to ferret out if there's animus, and that's the tools the court has developed to do it. But doesn't work in this context here, where you actually have evidence of animus. And the question is, OK, is the government's invocation of national security enough to sort of cure or sanitize that animus and take it out of the realm of hostility to religion and establishment clause violation or an equal protection clause violation. And, and so, the, and, and so as, as the dean said, the chief did exactly what the dean said, put out of your mind that it's the president, this president and the statements. In fact, he says, and this is a quote, we must consider not only the statements of a particular president, but also the authority of the presidency itself. So he did exactly that expressly did that and says, look, I'm going to look at the authority of the president. And when it comes to national security and protecting the borders, there's, that's where the president's powers are at its highest. And, and so that's sort of what the balance the chief and the rest of the court that went with him was coming to, is that do we want to create bad law that's going to hamstring the executive when they actually really need to invoke in a true emergency a national security justification for limiting the, the flow of energy. And that's what made this a really uphill battle for the challengers, is, 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 is the Supreme Court's reluctance to create those sort of constraints um, on, um, on the presidency um, itself. And I think that's really what was driving uh, that. Now, we, we can talk about Korematsu and why that, that national security justification, if there's any case in which it should raise red flags. You know, this is the one, just given all of the statements about the true purpose of the travel ban. And, and, and so, you know, history will tell us when we actually get to see, and, and like in Korematsu, or, or maybe more so in Korematsu, we've never seen that governmental report. Um, we know it was falsified in, in the Korematsu case, but we've never even seen the intergovernmental uh, report. That the government has kept hidden. So we don't really know what the actual findings were underlying it. And my guess is we won't know um, for a long time. But that's really, I think, the push and pull that was going on in the court's decision um, there. I think the one other interesting note I'd say about the court's uh, analysis there is Justice Kennedy's concurring opinion. Um, um, you know, of course, we didn't know he was going to retire at the time that he issued it. Um, but, but, you know, th this is what he says. I mean, it's interesting. He says, there are numerous instances in which the statements and actions of government officials are not subject to judicial scrutiny or intervention. That does not mean those officials are free to disregard the Constitution and the rights it proclaims and protects. An anxious world must know that our government remains committed always to the liberties of the Constitution, the, uh, the, the, the liberties the Constitution seeks to preserve and protect so that freedom extends outward and lasts. So it's almost as if Kennedy is talking to the president and said, please don't violate the Constitution. Um, um, because, you know, in certain areas, the court can't stop you. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, and please, so... Please don't do it while I'm in my comfortable retirement. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, that that, that that statement was intriguing. What was also intriguing to me about Kennedy's opinion is there's no mention of the hostility to religion rationale that was present in his masterpiece Cakes mm -hmm. decision. That was the case about the baker uh, uh, saying that I have a right not to... Um, not to bake a cake for a gay couple because he didn't support uh, gay marriage. It was contradictory to his religious beliefs. And Justice Kennedy's opinion, narrow opinion in that case, said, look, I'm going to avoid all these other harder First Amendment questions. But where you actually have overt hostility to religion, and they found in that case that that Colorado commission, they found a commissioner who said, look, uh, you know, we really don't want these sort of fanatical Christians out there um, um, doing these sort of things. He said, oh, when you have that sort of govern, uh, you know, express government hostility toward religion, then all bets are off. That's unconstitutional. But you don't get any flavor of that in, um, in the analysis of this decision where, of course, there was. So let me, let me, let me, because I, I do want to take questions. Let, let me, let me cut, cut straight to, to the comparison to Korematsu. So the majority, um, I mean, just as in Korematsu itself, the good news is that, uh, um, uh, racial and sexual classifications get strict scrutiny. The bad news is that one satisfies it. So in, the, in, in Trump against Hawaii, the good news is that the majority says 
um, uh, the dissent's reference to Korematsu, however, affords uh, this court the opportunity to make express what's already obvious. So the majority says, Korematsu was gravely wrong the day it was decided, has been overruled in the court of history, and has no place in law and the Constitution, right? So Korematsu is overruled, clearly uh, wrong, you know, void ab initio, but the majority says this case is not like Korematsu. Sotomayor says this case is like Korematsu. Um, I mean, two differences, of course, is that Korematsu, uh, the exclusion order, was an explicit ban against citizens of Japanese ancestry and uh, applied to citizens. Uh, no explicit ban here, and here the travel ban applies to non-citizens. So in light of that, who is right? Uh, is this like Korematsu or not? So I'll jump in quickly. Um, um, to me, the dispute back and forth between the majority and the dissent on the Korematsu question is just a disagreement about what Korematsu actually stood for. Um, if you think that Korematsu, if you think of Korematsu as a, you can look at Korematsu sort of as an individual rights, equal protection kind of case, or you can look at it as a national security case. If you look at it as an equal protection case, the court in overruling Korematsu um, is doing what Professor Adler just said. It's sort of finally coming around to acknowledging that it promised strict scrutiny in Korematsu. It didn't give strict scrutiny in Korematsu. It screwed up by accepting um, um, these arguments about the dangerous and suspicious nature of people of Japanese ancestry uh, and in um, sort of upholding the removal of every person of Japanese ancestry stretching from an elderly person in their 90s coming out of an old age home to be moved off the West Coast all the way down to a three-year-old orphan coming out of an orphanage in, in Los Angeles being removed to a concentration camp. That's one view. The other view is that Korematsu was a case kind of about really national security and the comparative power of the, of the, of the courts and the executive. Um, on that view, the mistake of Korematsu was its kind of credulous posture towards um, towards claims of national security, right? The government came in in, uh, in the Korematsu and Hirabayashi cases. Uh, there's a reason why I keep mentioning Hirabayashi. Um, and made all sorts of claims and asked the court to take judicial notice of the fact that the west coast of the United States was facing an imminent invasion by Japanese forces. Um, and that um, uh, people, one could reasonably infer that a person of Japanese ancestry um, would have feelings of attachment to Japan regardless of their citizenship that would make them um, uh, suspicious enough to, to uh, merit uh, removal. I mean, if you look at it that way, um, it's a different kind of analysis. Um, in that sense, the Supreme Court really kind of did do the same thing in this case as it had done in Korematsu. In Korematsu, the court blindly accepted um, sort of neutral-ish assertions by the, by, the, uh, by the government and didn't test them. Uh, and in this case as well, even in the face of clear evidence of animus, um, the court allowed itself to be swept away by these kind of, these efforts at cleaning, this, cleaning the order up and making it look neutral. So if you think about Korematsu as an equal protection decision, I think that you have one outcome on whether it is or not overruling the case. If you look at it as a national security decision, I think you come out in a different place. Dean Abrams, in case of Korematsu or not. I guess I think Korematsu has come to be a symbol for much more than the case. So if we're just looking at these two cases, no, I don't think this is Korematsu. I think the doctrine around immigration law is so different um, that I, I don't see this as, as all that analogous. But I think the context of both cases matters, and we don't yet know what the context of Trump v. Hawaii will be historically. So with Korematsu, I think it's important to think about everything else surrounding the case. Uh, the United States won the war. That's relevant in, in thinking about whether it was reasonable to in turn uh, Japanese American citizens or not. Um, the United States won the war uh, using nuclear weapons um, and has had some guilt, some national guilt about that, um, at least some soul searching about that. Um, at the time that Korematsu came down, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson was still good law. Brown versus Board of Ed Education had not been decided yet. Japanese Americans could not naturalize. Um, it was a very different world from now. And so 
that case, like others of that period, has come to stand for uh, a, a notion of race and racism that we have rejected as a society. Uh, if you look at Trump versus Hawaii, uh, you know during the early days of this administration, it appeared that the travel ban was going to be the linchpin of a new immigration policy. Um, now it's not the star anymore. Uh, we have families being separated at the border with Mexico. We now, in the last couple of weeks, have started to hear about people being required to show more than a birth certificate to demonstrate their US citizenship. Um, if they are of Mexican ancestry and found in South Texas, right? So there's a much bigger picture going on here about an administration with a particular view of immigration. And we don't know yet who will win the next couple of elections. We don't know whether there will be a major terrorist attack on the United States by someone from a predominantly Muslim country. So there are so many things that could happen that would make this case uh, seem uh, more or less uh, um, ill thought out that, that we can't even anticipate at this point that I, I don't know if I can say if it's the Korematsu of today. All right, Councilor Shaw, I'll give you a, a 30 seconds. Same case, different case, and then we'll open the floor for uh, argument. Uh, for sure. Point. I mean, I, I guess the only thing I'll say is it was um, uh, more bitter th uh, than sweet in the bittersweet of seeing the chief say that we officially now overrule Korematsu. You know, we, we went back and forth a lot actually with our team um, and the families and, and folks whether to ask the court to explicitly overrule Korematsu, and we did. But obviously that was with the hope uh -huh. that it would be Justice Kennedy uh, writing a decision that says we disclaim this. And because of that, we actually need to take a look at what the government is saying when, when there's reason to be uh, when, when there's reason to be suspicious about the claims of national security. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, um, and I talked to Karen Korematsu uh, probably within minutes after the decision uh, came out. And, you know, she had spent most of her life advocating for the reversal of Korematsu and educating folks. And um, it was a pretty deflating thing to get um, the Supreme Court to overrule it while upholding something like the travel ban. Um, um, and so I guess more bitter than sweet. Can I say 15 seconds? I, I just want to make clear why I keep harping on Hirabayashi. Um, I do think that it's um, uh, wonderful that the, the majority of the Supreme Court has now um, said that Korematsu is overruled. I think it's very unfortunate that there has been something of what you might call a fetishization of the Korematsu decision over the years and an insistence and a focus, a single-minded focus on the overruling of that case uh, because the Hirabayashi case has always flown off the radar screen, a nine to nothing decision that upheld a racial curfew. Um, a Defense Department brief uh, six months ago in Guantanamo was filed that openly cited and relied on Hirabayashi. Justice Thomas, uh, about 12, uh, well, actually in the, in the enemy combatant cases back in the early 2000s, openly cited Hirabayashi versus United States specifically for the proposition that the government, the mill, the executive deserves deference during periods of conflict and turmoil. So Hirabayashi is still out there, um, and it's the more dangerous decision because it's an approval of a much less draconian um, government action, a curfew compared to mass removal. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a little time for questions. Yes. Research with the Brennan Center during some of the early stages of the Trump v. Hawaii case. So it's really great to be here and hear um, you guys all talk about uh, the relevance of the case today and Kuramatsu as well. Um, I wanted to get at uh, the point that you raised, um, Mr. Shah, about um, the cursor report. It's only 17 pages long, the world, the supposed worldwide review of all visa-related uh, screening policies, um, given the claim that you made that if the government actually um, applied that as, uh, I guess, a coherent uh, national security rationale that, would may, that may have immunized um, some of the racial animus, right? If that, if that report were actually submitted, and if it were found that it was the research was insufficient, would that have um, you know, weakened uh, the government's claim? And also thinking about authority as well, um, given that the immigration power comes from the authority of the office of the president, um, should there be some level of deliberation involved? 
or is it just we're just ruling by decree and making arbitrary decisions? Sure. So, I mean, look, the, the courts are going to give a tremendous amount of deference to anything that is a colorable government analysis report. So if that report, whatever it says, if it actually goes through the steps and has a review and you know points to evidence that these particular countries have particular problems and that they foresee potential problems in the future with these respective countries, there's you know almost any court in the country is going to, I think, defer to that analysis and uphold it. And so if in any government, you have that sort of report, you show it, and, and you do it, maybe it's in camera. The, the thing that surprised me is when you have this sort of record of animus, right, the president making all of these statements, and even after the election saying, we know what I really mean here when he's signing the you know, revised travel ban, um, you know, when you have that, to not even ask for that report, or not even demand that the government give it to the court in camera, I was surprised. You know, we tried to kind of you know, draw that parallel and draw that fact out. Um, but it didn't get the type of traction um, 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 throughout the, the latter part of the litigation when, when, when it became uh, relevant. And so we don't know what that report says. We were able to figure out the page lengths because, you know, the government log has, you know, th these supposed worldwide review, the appendices are like five pages long. So, you know, uh, it just sort of, you know, uh, begs the question of what exactly they say, but w we just don't know. It very well may provide a you know ostensible justification that any court would have approved, but um, I think the 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 problem is that a court never got to see it. That to me is the problem. Unfortunately, we're out of time. The panelists will be up here. Uh, uh, please join me in thanking them for these terrific uh, presentations. <laughs>